<laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Guillaume Pouza, so I'm the CEO of Checkout.com. Today, um, it's not about me, it's about my friend Victoria. Um, she is one of the most amazing founders that I know. And by the way, to my daughter who's probably watching and live streaming, Marlo, who's 13, <laughs> pay, pay attention because uh, it's worth listening. Um, but it's one of the most amazing bootstrapping stories in our industry in fintech. And uh, Victoria, happy to have you here with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the incredibly kind words. I think um, everyone can agree this is almost a bit of a comical setup where <laughs> I told my colleague yesterday you know, that I was being interviewed by you and he was rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> he was like, surely it should be the other way around. Um, but in any case, uh, aside from amusing my colleagues, I'm, I'm very happy and very honored to be here with you. So, Lendable, um, incredible story. We'll talk about it a bit you know, after like, the bootstrapping aspect, but I think it's important for like, the audience and for everyone that we just, you know, maybe stick to the origin story. What's the product, what you're doing, how you got there. Yeah, I mean, you're the co-founder. Yes. Um, so the idea um, came from seeing that there were a lot of people in the UK um, who were looking to borrow, you know, small amounts of money between a thousand and thirty thousand pounds, um, but were finding it either very difficult, um, you know, it would take them several weeks or very expensive to do so. And so we thought if we can you know, build technology to completely automate the consumer lending process, um, we would be able to set up a platform and offer really attractive um, rates to consumers um, and great yields to investors. Um, and so we, we built this AI platform for consumer finance, um, starting with the product of personal loans and then over time adding credit cards, um, auto loans, we're now shortly going to launch buy now, pay later. Um, and the next step for the business is that we are expanding all of that in the in the US. Okay, exciting journey. I think, wow, we have a sound <laughs> issue. Uh, yeah. But the thing is, um, we uh, you did this all of it with a four million pound seed. So that's actually, I think we need to pause here for the audience. Quite often we hear all the stories of people who raise like a lot of money. Uh, four million pound seed, now it's a billion dollar business. Oh, you want to give me a mic? I can do a mic, no problem. It's okay, it's working? Okay, um, and so four million pound seed, you, was it always the strategy to bootstrap from the beginning? Was it a consequence? <coughs> How did you get there? Yes. Look, I think it would be really easy for me to sit here and say, oh, you know, it was always a strategy. We knew it from the get-go. I guess, first of all, you know, seed rounds back in the day, actually our seed round was something like 750k, um, which back in, the, back in the day was quite a cool seed round. Obviously today it's a very different market. Um, but I think that in retrospect, we realized that having very little capital to play with um, has allowed us to stay really focused on our mission, which was to build a true fintech, so really a technology-led um, company. Today you see a lot of businesses in the market that call themselves fintech, but they're really very big finance businesses with a website. Um, and from the get-go, we had this obsession with automation. Um, and we wanted to build technology and leverage technology in every piece of the value chain so that we could um, build the most efficient business in this space. Um, and of course, you know, it's very tempting along the way to um, hire loads of money and take shortcuts and you know, hire loads of people and um, throw money at a bunch of problems that arise. But the reality is you end up building a company on very weak foundations and you know in the future you have a huge cost base and you never really manage to reach profitability so um, I think that it was a blessing that we raised so little money and in fact you know we turned profitable quite early on like sort of breaking even after a couple of years and profitable after the third one um, and then over time you know if you do much larger fundraises or growth round you can really be in a much stronger position to negotiate and bring on investors that you really want to work with and you know take your time and choose who's a, the right strategic partner so um it wasn't it wasn't the strategy from day one but we realized over time that it is probably the best way to build a business. I guess you did a very similar strategy yourself, so I don't know whether you yeah, had I was planned it say, This sounds almost like my playbook of uh, uh, frugality to ultimately have uh, the ability to cut a, a good deal when you do a Series A, but I think if we go back on the frugality, which is probably one of the key things um, when you are like starved in cash, and if we zoom in on people, which for most tech companies is still like the main part of your OPEX, 
I always said that at checkout, you know, being really having limited funding forced us to make decisions as a team where, you know, every quarter we'd make like one hire in the early days and we'd make the decision together on like what was the right hire. And then as we start scaling, it would go to like one a month and then two a month. Can you tell us maybe a bit on your side, you know, like how you operated with your co-founders? Did everyone kind of agree on the like, you know, no full bootstrapping, no fundraising? How did you make your first hires and how you run through all of this? Yeah, so we, we had like a one in, one out policy. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so, no, we, um, yeah, we, it, it's exactly what you said. You know, we, we did not just go and try and hire, you know, people who had huge experience in that industry who were extremely expensive. We, you know, we hired few people that we thought were very smart and could look at problems in different ways. And we, we took a long time to hire those people. You know, we had um, conversations at length and debates um, because we had little capital to play with. So um, it, was, it was, yeah, it's, it's exactly how you, I guess, did it. For the audience, how many people do you have today at Lendable? So today we have something like 120 people. So and still quite a small team. Do you think that if you actually, you know, were to raise a big round in the future, would you change your strategy or do you think that this like, you know, embedded uh, frugality and I think like, you know, if I, I say at checkout, we did like, we had seven years of like being bootstrapped and this like really kind of created a DNA in the company of like spending every dollar like if it's your last. Um, and obviously we're hiring a lot of people right now, so I think maybe people would challenge me on that, but do you think it's going to change in the future? It's something that is now part of the culture of your company. Um, no, I think it is very much part of the culture and the DNA and the, you know, the, the plans that we have um, potentially to raise additional capital in the future um, are not around suddenly hiring you know, huge teams to figure out things. We still very much have this obsession on trying to automate everything and build a completely you know, automated product for, for our customers. And so, um, yeah, the capital wouldn't be derived to that. And we, we, we love this idea of being very frugal, um, even to this day. Um, so one of the direct kind of consequences in Corollaire of uh, being frugal is usually you're profitable. <laughs> I am, I'm not going to put you here on the stand and ask you how much in front of everyone, but I think like, do you think that, you know, as a profitable is a good thing for a fintech? Should we reinvest profitability or again, it's something you're going to keep over the long run because we always hear these, you know, investors and other models where people, you know, re spend everything, you know, either be loss making a bit as year. What's your strategy over the long run and, you know, how profitable Endable really is? I mean, that is, that is very true. Investors do hate it. Um, we, we get always told, you know, why, why are you profitable? Like, why are you profitable? Surely you're, you're, not, you're not growing fast enough. You know? But I think the reality is... Um, if you're profitable and you're not growing fast, then maybe it's a problem. But in our case, um, I think we are quite uniquely, meaningfully profitable, but also growing over 100% year on year and also at scale, um, which we have been told is a is a quite a cool combination to have. Um, so we yeah we intend on staying very much profitable. There is an investor, which I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, shy the name, who told me it's like unusual to see these type of numbers. So I think like <laughs> you're definitely doing a good job. Um, I, I'll just go and say one thing now is like, do we, do we need capital today to start a company? So if we go back for the audience that is here, when you have your seed or, you know, your friends and family, you, you, I mean, I read the same news than you do. People who, you know, raise giant seeds and raise a lot of money. Um, in your opinion, uh, you know, do you think it's the right thing? Is the industry going to the right direction or is it something you, what would be your advice to founders towards like the use of capital in the early days? Yeah. Um, so I think obviously it's, it's, you know, it's nonsense to assume that you always need loads of capital to build a big business. And I guess we are life examples that that is not true. I'm not saying that, you know, it's the same for all sectors, you know, companies like, I don't know, Uber is obviously will have needed a lot of capital to, to become big. But in general, if you think about what it means to, you know, to build a business today and the difference with what it would have meant for our parents' generation, um, you know, if they wanted to build a business, they would have to, before starting anything, you know, spending 200K on servers and then, you know, put it in the docklands. And today, um, you've got things like, you know, Amazon Web Services, which will give you a free year on which you can build anything. Um, and it's amazing, it's super cheap. The second thing is obviously, um, nowadays you've got, 
you know, with the rise of APIs, um, a landscape in fintech which is basically loads of interconnected communities, and you will have, you know, Revolut for your debit account, and then TransferWise for your FX, and then, you know, checkout for payment processing. And so, if you can identify a niche. Um, which allows you to use all of these different um, companies that have been built before you, um, you don't need very much money. And this is the case of Lendable, right? We are integrating with checkouts to do payment processing. And so we don't have to worry about that whole part. Um, and I think those are the, the sorts of businesses that are particularly interesting because you can build them on very little money. Um, aside from that, there are so many other things, other tools available to entrepreneurs, like, you know, think about it, LinkedIn, right? Recruitment is super cheap. You can just write to anyone. Um, our parents would have had to have all sorts of pre-existing social connections. You have like open source software. You've got free learning from the internet. It's the, it's the most exciting and the cheapest time, even though there is so much capital in the market. It is actually the best time to start a business. Okay, I have to ask this question uh, because I was going to ask another question. But like, <laughs> are you still cold calling people on LinkedIn to join the company to this level of scrappiness? I mean, we used to do this for many years. I, I mean, I mean, like absolutely. This is the whole frugality, you know, paying for recruitment firms. That's a <laughs> that's a real luxury which we will only you know only really do when we can't get someone. But I have um I have this trick where, you know. Some of my colleagues, they all have my LinkedIn passwords. <laughs> and so um, it looks better if you know, someone slightly senior in the company tries to recruit you. So they, they, they use my account as a result. OK, so that's <laughs> no longer you cold calling people, but it's OK. Um, it kind of looks like me. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I'll say, maybe it's an, um, an advice for, for the audience here just in general, because we've been through that journey ourselves, is that the more genuine you can be, and if you show to the people that you target that you truly care about them and that they have a role to play in your company, be it five, 10, you know, 200 employees, it goes a long way. So I think like I use a ton of recruiters. <laughs> we have, I think, a 30 people recruiting team just on the recruiting <laughs> side today. But it, it, you know, like taking the time to craft a good cold call email to somebody that you target is definitely a plus. No, uh, no, of course, absolutely. Um, and I think also, you know, everyone who works at Lendable has equity. And you know, incentivizing and making people feel a part of the team, and especially if you can manage to build a big company while retaining a small team, there's a real, you know, um, I guess, family feeling around around the company, and that's that's a big plus. What was the what was the take of the investors on the whole frugality? And like you like you said, they want you to go and spend money, but like there is still like quite some time that has been you know uh, uh, elapsed between your you know your four million la pound last round and what might come next. So. Is it something that when you're at the board meetings, they're telling you, hey, uh, Vic, go and raise a ton of money. The business is performing awesome. Or is it something like, you know, they understand your DNA? I was with, uh, with Tom Stafford just like an hour ago on another scene here. And he, he was raising or like highlighting that he liked the frugality approach, which is unusual for their portfolio. Uh, what's the take of your investors? And without pointing anyone, just the general scent. Uh, yeah, um, well, I guess, I guess it depends whether for your specific type of business, the bottleneck is capital, and whether you could do you know, much better things and faster if you had access to money. If that was the case, you know, we, would just, we would just raise loads of capital and spend it where we could. But because we are a lending business, um, and we are originating assets um, over numerous years, there is no real way to accelerate that without jeopardizing you know, the portfolio quality. And so you can't really fast forward time. And you know, even if you were to raise loads and loads of money, you can't just decide to suddenly offer loans to the entire market without you know, basically relaxing your credit rules just to, to increase fees and your revenue. So, I guess they're, they're, you know, they're, they're fine with it because it's, it's simply not a good strategy for the business that we are. And, and in fact, most of the investors that we have brought on you know, between the first year of our business and the start of this year have been strictly on a secondary basis because we had no need for capital. We were mean, meaningfully profitable and so, you know, we, yeah. Um, and so like, okay, you, you didn't need the, the need for capital, but I wanted now still in terms of helping the audience here and being, um, you know, creating valuable content. If we think about of go to market and like, so you build an incredible product uh, that is in the daily lives of millions in the UK. Uh, you know how to originate loans and do it efficiently. How was your go to market? Basically, can you run a little bit? What is a scrappy go to market strategy and 
I, I want to say one thing, by the way. Scrappy is a compliment. Uh, you know, it's something at Checkout we take very seriously. I think quite often if you embed frugality early on, you see people taking a lot of money to do certain things that you can just be a bit smarter to do them. And I'll, I'll put this, it's a true compliment. So like, let's, if we double down on kind of go to market a little bit. Uh, yeah, again, again, it's so, so product specific. So if you think about the neo banks, for example, you know, when they go to market, they have to spend millions, sometimes hundreds of millions in acquiring customers that will end up on their app and potentially be unprofitable to them because they just use their service without, you know, using the service on that bank account that makes um, the, neo, the neo bank money. Um, in our case, if you think about the concept of taking out a loan, um, it has little advantage to try and spend or splurge money on direct marketing because, you know, when you take out a loan, you have to have a reason for it and you start paying interest, you know, the day you do um, on a monthly basis. And so you wouldn't really, you know, take it out without an idea of why. And so the way that you distribute a product like that in the market is very different. Um, and it's specifically sort of a pool marketing strategy where you integrate via um, um, aggregator websites. And in our case, we were actually the player in the market that moved um, those distribution channels towards um, full integration. So now in the UK, if you want to take out a loan and you go to these you know, big channels where the majority of the traffic online goes, um, customers will give like very basic data and we've built technology to give them an instant decision. So in one click we can say, hey Guillaume, you want to loan this is your rate and then in a few minutes you've got the money in your account. And so we know that we will only ever pay those partners when we complete a loan. Um, and so the distribution is very frugal in a sense because you already know before starting what your unit economics are and you know that you're going to write a profitable loan. Um, so that is basically because of the nature of product. Now we've got credit cards, that's a bit different because a credit card you can take without knowing what you're going to spend it on. And so there we are starting to, uh, you know, see the, I guess, the benefits of direct marketing, which is a bit more costly and, a, you know, you need a bit more capital to play with. What's interesting is that if I just like, you know, from a reference, from a checkout standpoint, we ended up doing like only enterprises because we didn't have marketing money. And we always say that our go-to-market almost was organic. We had all the licenses, we had all the technology, and we had a product that educated buyers would understand versus an emotional buyer. And like big payments teams and the world's largest companies, they understand this. And so what's interesting when I hear you is that it's almost a B to B to C in the sense of like you disintermediate yourself a little bit from the end consumer, but you don't have the, the cost. Yeah, and, and, and I guess in our case, another thing is that you want to avoid adverse selection as much as you can if you're trying to write the best loans in the market. And so if you're going to splurge money on you know, putting your brand on every London bus, you might attract consumers who have you know, worse sort of credit features than others because you know, someone who by definition is a, you know, is a good borrower is going to go online and see what are the offers in the market and I want to take the, you know, the most attractive one because you know, I take care of my finances. Um, and again, so these are the things that we, we have to consider when we do marketing at scale. Okay, now switching gears a little bit, uh, let's maybe talk about the founders. Uh, what, are your, I mean, what are the traits of characters that you, you find in a good founder? And like we said, we talked about a bit of a different <coughs> model that you and I, we agree on that is actually possible, the bootstrapping approach. Um, what are the traits of character that you think are valuable? Look, I think, <laughs> I think that successful entrepreneurship requires being slightly naive. Um, you know, when we started out, we had zero experience in consumer credit. Um, nobody had worked at a big, you know, consumer lending firm. And so we were, you know, incredibly confident. We thought, Super simple. We're going to build technology. It's going to be all automated. We're going to keep costs low and make a super profitable business. Obviously, the reality is you run into so many challenges along the way. But because you, know, you approach everything with naivete, you've got this sort of beginner's mind idea and you do things completely differently. Um, and that is very useful when you build a business, right? So it, it is not a coincidence that it was Elon Musk that built Tesla and not someone who spent 20 years at Volkswagen. Apparently, someone told me when they were working on the Model 3, they spent three years, um, you know, working on just the tires and then suspension and then the chassis. Like, three years just to find the right kind of rubber that would have 
you know, that, that would have been crazy for someone who worked in the traditional car manufacturing industry. So I think, yeah, being slightly naive, approaching things with a, a big inner mind is probably, you know, key to successful entrepreneurship. I don't know what you think. <laughs> what do you think? I was laughing because the naive comment is something that I say uh, to my kids, that I say to my company. I always joke that, you know, if the world, if people were entering into relationships, into discussion, trusting the other straight away as opposed to trying to challenge the, <laughs> the, the content, the world would probably be a better place. Uh, so I think like uh, it's the first time I hear this one and, uh, and it's a good thing, but I think um, you know the, if you're if you're a founder and you're not dreaming big or you're not aspiring, I mean I think it's you, you should do more. I mean it's there's sky's the limit, like you say we need to keep pushing and you know it's, I had an advice once which was told to me by an investor which I really like. He always told me the best entrepreneurs are the ones who think in 10 year increments. So it's not about what you do today; it's what you know where the world is going. And he was like, if you're able to project yourself this far. Uh, you know, it's and you need to be naive to believe that comment altogether. But I yeah. think like uh, we've tried to do this from the early days at checkout. We underwrite the fact that there is a rate of change, that businesses are changing, that there is the vaults of the world bolt in this region. And, and I guess like you, th there is a real sense that you know, if you don't know about the institutional complexity of a company like ours, then you know you will be very enthusiastic about building it. And over time, you see that it's highly complex. But when you start out, you see everything as extremely simple and straightforward. And I don't know whether you have that same feeling that you know, after eight years and seeing all of the things <laughs> that we didn't know about, that we had to deal with, you know, I would never do it again. <laughs> and I guess, you know, I'm now very excited that I always feel that we have now figured it out and the next 10 years are going to be probably very straightforward, super simple what we need to do. And it's always like that. You then look back and you're like, oh my God, it was nothing like I thought. <laughs> do you have a similar feeling? Uh, I love how genuine you are because <laughs> I'm not sure I'd go and say that I wouldn't do it again. I love my company, I'd do it forever, but dealing in 19 countries and licenses from Mexico to uh, Brazil to <laughs> Japan, yeah, definitely there's a lot of complexity to deal with. Um, about you know future countries and expansions, can you tell me a bit more where Lendable is going? You know what what do you have in stock for uh, for what's coming? Yeah, so we we uh, you know we have very exciting plans. We um, we're going to the US, um, which is obviously for what we do a market 10x the size of the UK, um, and in many ways, you know in our view resembles the the, the UK market. Um, you know, you've got the same data providers, you've got the same asset buyers, the same um, distribution channels are actually the same companies in both countries. Um, so we have a very, you know, clear view on how we are going to enter that market. Now, obviously, in the details, everything is different, and so we are working on that and building that right now. Um, but we think that we will be live you know, writing loans and offering um, the whole suite of products in the US uh, next year. So that's very exciting. Are you moving to the US? I, I, uh, I would like to move to the US. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to initially travel back and forth quite a lot, but, but probably not move full time. Um, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a, a super like exciting place to be. We have a little office in New York. and Biggest market and a very cool place to do business. Okay, a uh, few maybe words of wisdom. I mean, like I said, you're one of the most incredible founders I know, and I think we have to highlight this again. Uh, a female leader in fintech, bootstrapped the company, super nice, always there for her friends. I mean, <laughs> lots of compliments. I could keep going. Um, and I think, you know, there's definitely like founders here uh, which would love to hear a bit of your wisdom, so. Oh dear. <laughs> you did not warn me about this question. <laughs> um, a, a word of wisdom. Look, I think, I think what's the most important thing is you just got to enjoy what you do. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate to start this company with incredible co-founders who are, you know, still today my best friends. And um, that's just been, that's just been inc incredibly exciting. And so still today we, you know, we go to the office and we have a great time. And I think that's, that's probably priority number one, especially if you, you know, if you give so much to your work. Um, yeah, surround yourself by the, the right people and have a good time. Okay, um, thank you very much. <laughs> this was like very, uh, you know, insightful. And like I said, I hope for everyone that, you know, you enjoyed this um, and good luck to Lendable. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.